Great. Okay, so welcome everybody. It's 7.30 p.m. Welcome to our Tiny Disc Adventure live Q&A with Darshan Ajayawadana. I really hope that you have had an opportunity to watch his video. Um, there were comments on it. I know lots of hearts on the, uh, on the video. Uh, a lot of people really, really enjoyed it uh, because it gave you a glimpse into what's really down there in Sri Lanka itself. And I think that was what was really appealing for many people. Um, but, you know, I, uh, while I'm a diver as well, DJ takes it to a whole, uh, DJ is what we fondly call him, he takes it to a whole other level. And I'm really excited to bring him into this space today just to, you know, have a can com conversation. Uh, you can see a little bit about what drives him, but, you know, just so you guys can get a little up close and personal, um, I'll ask a few questions, have a casual chat. And towards the end, which will be in 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to wrap up in that time. If there's anything that you're burning question, do please feel free to post it in the comments. I will try to catch up with that. Um, just one thing, there's more light on his face. The quality of the video will go up too. Uh, yes, but I think that's the only light he has. Yes, that's the only so thing I have. To, yeah. You're going to have to imagine how perfectly beautiful he is. You know, okay. I can change my internet connection and see. Quickly, do you want me to do that? You can try. I mean, you, you're yeah. perfectly Give fine. Second, yeah. see you. I can hear you, but you can try. The technology um, challenges of uh, going live are immense. Uh, we've definitely had to work through a bunch of different challenges um, through this time with our setups. So I think. See whether it's uh, whether it works. Maybe it won't. But yes, uh, I mean, you look the same, Jimmy. But I know what you look like, so I don't know how much All it right, matters. Okay. Really. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're here. Yeah, we've got you here. We've got you captive. Uh, you have an audience. Uh, there are lots of people who are excited about shipwrecks. I know people who were like, oh, it's shipwreck time, you know, um, and very, very excited. And so I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, what some people might know is that we are friends. So we have beyond on the fact that I admire you and all your work. We are, we are friends as well, but this, uh, so this conversation is really going to be very casual and probably some, like something we'd normally talk about. But um, I want to start up, I, I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to kind of lead off with, but this is, you know, we just roll. Um, so I guess one of the first questions someone wanted to know, and it's appropriate to start off with it, is um, what kind of planning and sort of background research do you do before you go out there looking for these shipwrecks? Uh, well, it depends, and uh, I, I would say that there's a lot of planning going on in some cases, especially if it's about finding a shipwreck, uh, which means that I have to figure out where the location is, and for that, uh, the, the one of the ways I occupy is to actually talk to fishermen, because they are the people who are in the ocean, and uh, their nets get entangled in various shipwrecks, and they know they have the most intelligence exactly where shipwrecks are, so that's part of the preparation. Then I spend hours going through, so imagine I find a shipwreck, right? And then I sometimes have to go through various archives, uh, books, and uh, find possible candidates for those shipwrecks, uh, match features, and it can uh, you know, be hours of work in some uh, certain cases. So a lot of preparation before yeah. you go and also after you find the shipwreck to really figure out what it is. Yeah, and also good relationships, right? Because like at the end of the day, uh, the fishermen, I mean, in your case, there are fishermen who will sometimes get their nets snagged on something and they'll call you and say, you know, we think there might be a wreck down here or something like that, right? That's happened to you as well. Absolutely. I mean, thing is now I am not in the ocean all the time, right? So it's almost impossible to just go out in the ocean and just sweep the whole ocean and find shipwrecks. So you have to rely on the intelligence of uh, the fishermen. And you know, once a fisherman... Uh, called me and said, listen, one of my friends in Pasikuda, he was pulling his net up and there was a piece of aluminum in it. And then I met him, I investigated and then found a World War II plane. Uh, of course, it took a lot of work to ID it, but that's one of the great examples of how, how they came around and helped me with it. Yeah, and I mean, and I think we can't emphasize that enough, you know, that importance of um, recognizing that there is knowledge out there and that Absolutely. we can all of that knowledge is what can, you know, help us to build these greater stories. So it's never, as much as you're a solo diver, right? In many ways, you do a lot of this diving on your own, but there's a team that sort of works with you or supports you in many, many different ways. 
is I, I, I would say, right? Yeah, so I think uh, the whole issue is that some of these uh, shipwrecks are really deep, and then you need mm -hmm. technical diving skills to explore them. So one of the problems I have is that uh, there are not many technical dives, I would say just a handful. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that's one part. On the other hand, I kind of prefer to dive alone because then it's just me and uh, I mm -hmm. can really focus on the task at hand. I think you know, right? You always complain <laughs> that I'm an awful buddy and uh, yeah. I keep disappearing. But it's actually you guys who keep disappearing on me most of the time. Right, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, what I should probably clarify to the audience at this point, one <laughs> second, is that Typically with diving, and if you're not a diver, if you're not familiar, you always dive with a buddy, right? So you always dive and you dive together with someone else and the whole dive you're together because there's a safety element to that. Uh, but uh, DJ is, uh, he's actually trained to be a solo diver. Um, it suits his personality very well because he's very focused on his task and he can often forget that he has someone else with him. But I do want to put that caveat in here that he is, this is what he's trained to do. So he knows how to manage a situation if it arises on his own. And he's got the personality type, I think, in many ways um, to kind of get through some of those situations on his own as well, right? So, so like with your training, like you've done so much training. Can you give us a ballpark figure of like how many hours you've trained to be able to do this sort of tech diving that you do? Yeah, so I think that's a very good question, and uh, I think just to comment on your first part about solo diving, it's not it's not something that you can do just because you have a scuba tank and you are trained to dive. You can't just go solo diving. It's actually an art and a science, and you have to be properly equipped for it. You need to have the proper training. Actually, it's not really solo diving. It's self-sufficient diver. Because in a, in a situation where you are, let's say you are just diving with a buddy and, and you run out of air, you have to rely on your buddy for air, right? So what if what happens if you are alone? What do you do? So self-sufficient diver is someone who has not just one tank, maybe two or three tanks, then uh, various other equipment, navigation equipment, cutting devices. What if you get entangled in a fishnet underwater? Who's going to save you, right? So you've got to cut yourself out. So there's so many things that you've got to be prepared for. So that's uh, that part. And uh, also when it comes to tech diving, and it generally refers to diving that's done deeper than 40 meters, uh, and also yeah. incurs obligation of decompression, which means that you go down, you explore your dive site, and you stay so long that you can't come up quickly. You have to you come, come up stage side. by Exactly, you can't just come up. If you come up, you get decompression sickness. And you can either paralyze so you can die of death so you've got to come up in stages and that means that you've got to plan your gases your bottom times uh, then um, how much uh, you know time you need to come up all the gases and then also when you go deep you have so many complications with the different types of gases you need to use uh, the air we breathe will actually make you drunk if you go down, go below 30 meters so you got to use helium the oxygen we breathe starts getting poisonous as you go deeper, right? So there's so many complications. So you've got to plan for all those. And uh, so I think the important thing here is that it's not about just doing these things. Uh, I think what I did was I just took small steps mm -hmm. and uh, not really rushing with the goal of, you know, going to 100 meters as soon as I started diving. So I just took, uh, and as a diver, I think it's important to always challenge yourself and refine your skills. And once you uh, keep on doing courses, and I think I've done about maybe 20, 25 courses and hundreds of hours of training. And uh, each time I do something, I know that I, I can do something a little bit more. So that I just keep progressing because I know I'm confident that I can take the next step. Yeah. So and that's how we have it works. Yeah. yeah. And the confidence doesn't come from, it's not a cocky confidence. It is genuinely a confidence that, that comes from training and experience and the baby steps which is really important but i mean there's a question that came through uh which asked have you ever encountered any dangerous situations and as much as you can be prepared i'm sure there are moments when maybe things have gone wrong thankfully you've been safe but have there been any situations that you can you know talk about which has been a little bit dangerous or uh, to me like scary basically everything you do is scary but yeah yeah, I guess uh, um, I have, and uh, it it uh, also 
uh, is based on two factors and as as you say some of those incidents were based on me being cocky and taking unnecessary risks and uh, the second one has been in situations where they have been properly equipped properly trained but you still have uh, problems right so mm -hmm. in the first instances where maybe i got trapped inside a shift break for example i think you know you were in that divers when i i disappeared mm -hmm. there that was a stupid thing to do and that was uh, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that i actually started cave diving Uh, because mm. I needed to explore shipwrecks, and as part of exploring shipwrecks, I needed to go inside shipwrecks. And you mm -hmm. can't, you shouldn't be doing that without proper training, because inside shipwrecks can be really dead traps. You you can just go in, but you might never come out for so many reasons. You you will lose your way, you get disoriented, stuff can fall on you, uh, the visibility can go to zero. So I learned so many things from my first mistake. and that was one of the reasons i wanted to do cave diving because in cave diving you are taught to handle all those situations uh, so mm. yes there's been dangerous situations and uh, but i was i never had a dangerous situation with uh, any marine animal if that's the answer some people are looking for like maybe shark attack or anything like that so and no. at least but at least of my problems are sharks really yeah that's true um and i think going back to you know this this um this incident that you are referring to that um myself and our friend manju were present at um i remember when you came up when i'm not going to into the details of how stressed i was through the whole thing and how annoyed and angry i still am you know maybe 10 years later but um i do i remember you know you said how you went into this space and you made a mistake in terms of you know making sure you knew where you were but it was also this silt right that was uh, kind of started churning around it became dark and sort of when you describe these things it's obviously for someone like me it's pretty nerve wracking uh but i have to say that it, it's not just that but you know it, it's sure your training and stuff helps but also just your calmness right being able to sort of like slow down and 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 have faith in yourself at that point probably really helped you in that situation actually that's the only thing that uh, saved me of out of all the wrong things i did the final tipping point was how i i can handle the situation and and that's the when it came to a point where i was so much of trouble that mm. panic was coming from my stomach and it's a very sickening feeling and uh, mm. that's the moment where you have the flight of fight response either you start you know panicking and trying to fight it or you start to run away from the situation and make it worse so mm. fortunately i remembered some of my training and what i did was i actually closed my eyes and calm myself down and then stop the panic then i mm -hmm. figured out if i had come in there has to be a way out and i felt my way out because i was completely blind inside that small space in the shipwreck and uh, i managed to find a, a small uh, wall for, went uh, into a place but again there was no way to go there was a small hole so i managed to remove my all my equipment put it out and then escape so mm -hmm. it was part luck part training also part knowing that survived. myself And, and part knowing that myself and sorry it was man, not Manju Narin but uh, on that dive waiting that train, yeah. um, to uh, to ask you questions around it. Um, okay, so there's been some other questions. Uh, one question that went past was, uh, "Is diving healthy?" So I'm going to ask you that in conjunction with, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, is diving healthy? I mean, I don't. That's a pretty open question, but I, it's good for you, right? It's an exercise. It's a sport, mental exercise, perhaps. Um. I think diving is like every other sport in a certain sense uh, what you need is actually you need to be healthy to dive mm. diving doesn't necessarily make you healthy but for your safety and for your well being you need to be physically fit to dive because it can impose so much stress the cold of the water fighting currents you have to have good cardiovascular you know uh, fitness and uh, but diving if you if you are looking for the other meaning if if whether diving can cause you harm uh, so far as far as i know there is no significant scientific evidence that diving does cause any uh, harm however if you for example dive while you are dehydrated and if you take um, uh, if you ascend fast food sur surfers you can build uh, micro bubbles in your bloodstream and and that can have some uh, impairment in your in your physiology uh, in your tissue mm -hmm. you can have tissue damage and you can have bone necrosis because the nitrogen bubbles can actually destroy but if you if you are a safe diver 
and you are healthy dio it's it is no damage as far as i know okay and and that's a, and that's a good good message i think i also think it's uh, i like that you uh, you corrected us it's not that uh diving is not necessarily healthy but you have to be healthy for diving and and to all of you who follow our tiny desk adventures you know on our website not only do we post the videos but we also have a little guest q and a we ask our guests a set of 10 questions so you can get to know them better and one of the things you know one of the questions is what's the first thing you do um when you wake up in the morning and dj works out uh, so he um typically will walk an enormous number of kilometers in a very limited space in circles um uh, which we're still trying to come to terms with but it's cool like he might walk, walk six kilometers in a what's the loop on your rooftop it's about uh, i think about uh, 50 meters around okay so 50 meters he does about six kilometers he does push ups he does squats he does a lot of uh, you know physical work um and it is important to stay healthy because you know you kind of have to be fit and in relation to what you said dj in terms of um you know you can get you know you're fighting the current and stuff someone has asked have you ever got carried away by the current or zipped away by a current like is there something you can say about that yeah there have been couple of incidents i i think the most memorable incident was when i was diving the hms hermes and that's a uh, world war 2 well you know i don't know whether you guys know but we sri lanka has an aircraft carrier but it's at the bottom of the ocean it's uh, one of the deepest wrecks in sri lanka uh, i would say the fourth deepest wreck and to dive that you need to have technical diving skills and i was di- diving this once again i was diving it solo and uh, i came up and then started drifting because the current was uh, so strong and i had to i had about 1 hour of decompression so i drifted for about 5 kilometers during that 1 hour i had to stay under water coming up slowly and uh, yes so that's the experience where i got caught to current how it turned out to be a remarkable experience because when i was at my one of my last stops at 6 meters i saw this silvery shape from the corner of my eye and i i, was, I actually got frightened I, i'll be honest i thought it was a large shark and my heart skipped to beat but when i looked at it it was a whale and it was so strange because this whale was real looking at me it was almost as if it was concerned for me and it was looking at me and uh, then i did a very stupid mistake i forgot that i was in trouble and i started uh, swimming towards the whale yeah and that spooked the animal obviously so it uh, took a breath and then went back into the deep ocean then i think i showed you the video and you identified it as a a brooder whale is that how it's called yeah. Yeah. Brides are brutus, yeah. Brides brutus, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty spectacular, but that's true, right? Like, I think one of the things is with diving, you have to be very conscious of what you're doing at all times, right? So you, it's easy to get carried away, not just by currents, but just by when you're down at the bottom, you see something amazing, you're taking a photograph, you're so focused on that that you can lose track of time and lose track of, you know, uh, you know. the sense of how much air you have or anything like that and i think being completely uh, always being engaged and very focused and stuff really helps in those situations right yeah um so there was another question do you do all your training or courses have you done them all in sri lanka yeah so uh, one of the limitations of uh, when it comes to technical diving is that sri lanka doesn't have many schools now there are there's about one school that starts doing uh, technical diving but i started my tech courses about uh, more than 10 years ago and gradually uh, did that so my instructor was in thailand that's where i did most of my cave diving deep diving rebreather diving uh, so I, i actually worked with one instructor all along and he was my guru and taught me everything uh, there has to be uh, to learn in this uh, tech diving sport but in sri lanka now slowly there is more interest in tech diving and schools are coming up but at least there's one school uh, in particular that's actually specializing in diving the hermits right and uh, and so there's a question around your cave diving so let's introduce introduce that first you know um how did you discover this that you could dive in the caves in in ella Yeah so again uh, I think it was all started with shipwrecks as I said I wanted to explore shipwrecks more I had to go inside so I had actually no intention of diving caves I'll really be honest I didn't like caves you know it looked cold do, uh, dark and blue I didn't want to really go there what's the ice nothing right 
so but for me to explore shipwrecks i needed to i needed to get the training that enable me to safely swim in a enclosed space so the problem mm. of going in a shipwreck or a cave is that if something happens there is no direct ascent to the surface you have to come out the same way you go in and that can be really tricky because when you turn back and, and if you are in a rush and you try to come out you might not find your way or you might not see where you are going right so it's very very dangerous uh, in that aspect so you need to have the proper gear and training so i thought okay let me explore shipwreck safely you know without making the stupid mistakes i has to make so i started cave diving as a, a way of uh, learning those techniques and uh, i must say the first experience going in a cave was quite uh, uh, it was very bad it it uh, I, i almost gave up because it was so frightening and i was very uncomfortable it was so claustrophobic but again i calmed myself down and it was almost as if the switch went off or switch went on and suddenly i was this completely unemotional human being uh, navigating through the caves and then it started becoming a something exciting it became mm. it became started becoming something that gives you a adrenaline rush because you have to crawl through tight spaces it's dark and then you need to do so many exercises to uh, to you know to drills and, and 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 once you do that you get so much confidence and you feel so good about doing something that's really challenging uh, suddenly i realized that caves were a fun thing to do and and that's how i started cave diving in in thailand so i explored a lot of caves in thailand and when i came back the first question i asked was hang on you know i am in sri lanka where are the caves in sri lanka where i can dive so i was looking around talking to geologists and uh, trying to figure out you know where are the caves and then i heard from uh, some of my friends uh, you know manju and uh, kami and a couple of upekshi that uh, there was this presumably a underwater cave in alle or at least there's a pool so mm. that's how i started going there and exploring that yeah that's and um, i mean So there's a question here can you not follow a line if you leave the way you go in and it's related to the question I also had in mind which was can you walk us through what it's like to go on a cave dive like you know what do you have to think about when you're on this dive because so in my mind and based on like the visuals I've seen that you you know shared with us it's basically just a murky small tight space with a lot of silt um and back scatter uh because of the particles and light um and uh, but you know you need to be it's you're kind of like you're almost blind in these spaces so so related to the question in terms of the line like how do you attach the line and how do you move through these spaces can you just give us the idea yeah. okay i'll ask you a question how many times have you gone into a large building daytime right with uh-huh. when there's lights and you actually couldn't find your way out you can't remember how you got out and you had to ask someone and that that's what happens right Yeah, we, and my sense of direction is particularly bad. So well, yeah, it happens to me all the time as well. I don't know whether I turn left or right. I need to ask, okay, where's the exit, right? So imagine you are in a cave, you go in, it's dark, and you lose yourself. There's no one to tell you where to go out. So the line is a very fundamental and very reliable piece of technology which never fails. It doesn't run on batteries. It's there, unless you actually cut it, right? It's it's always there. And it's like a cop. all right yeah. <laughs> yeah so so a cave divers one of the most important uh, uh, tools is a line and uh, what we actually have it's called a reel where the line is attached and we carry about four to five reels uh, so first thing to do is when you go in you will tie that line every so often into some part of the cave uh, maybe a small rock or maybe you know, whatever you find and um, so so what that enables you to do is imagine your torches all blow out right it's completely dark or imagine that you disturb silt and it's like swimming in coffee you can't find your way out right as long as your hand is on the line you can make it out and then you are trained to do that actually during all the cave courses so for example that's one of the dives that i really hated my one of my first dives instructor took me to 30 meters in a very deep cave I was blindfolded under water my mask was removed and I had to find my way out just using the line so oh. like and and that really freaked me out before I had that switch thing going on and I I you know suddenly became like okay this is cool I can do it 
So you got to have that type of training and uh, mindset because, uh, and it's happened to be in uh, the dives subsequently. I did my torch went off or the silt was so bad, you really can't see where you are. And if you don't have the line, there's no way you, you can come out. So it's very important line. Yeah, and, and just to point out to people, you know, when DJ says diving in a cave and you can't go straight up, it's, it's if you don't really know, if you're not familiar what it looks like, it's usually just, you know, from up here, you have a, like a, a tube that goes through yeah. uh, underwater. And so you're following the tube. So, so if you like run out of air or if something goes wrong here, you can't come up because there's a ceiling. Uh, okay. You have to come back up the same path, the same narrow path. And so that's something that you, you know, it's very different to like the other diving that people will do. And, and it does take a lot of thought and a lot of training. And, and you know, like you say, DJ, sometimes, uh, sometimes the, um, the, lowest te- the lowest technology tools are the most valuable because you, they're unfailing in these situations. Um, someone had asked if you've ever seen bioluminescent algae when you were in the caves by any chance? No, not really. I mean, uh, so some of the caves I dived have been in very deep places. Even if you take the cave in uh, Sri Lanka, it's actually 80 meters underground. So you got to crawl through 80 meters of rock before you come to this underground underground pool. And then I start the dive. Okay. So when I started, I'm already 80 meters underwater, which means there's no sunlight at all, right? So it's very, it's almost like a, I would say like a cocoon, like a time capsule where this body of water has been preserved, untouched for such a long time. And by the time you come down to 80 meters, there's no life anyway. Once uh, I've observed like small worms swimming on the surface of the lake, but underwater, I have not seen any life. In some of the other caves, I have seen maybe like small shrimp, catfish, but it's all at the surface, but nothing bioluminous at, at all in the caves. Okay. And so there's another question about how many ca- uh, how many shipwrecks have you encountered around Sri Lanka and how often do you get to explore them? Uh, there are so many shipwrecks uh, because uh, my uh, one of my sayings is where there are ships, there are wrecks. And uh, they sink all the time, right? And there are thousands and thousands of ships around Sri Lanka. Historically, there is about maybe 200 to 300 shipwrecks. But the problem is they are in very deep waters. And uh, so far, I know about maybe 100 wrecks that you can actually dive around Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. And um, it's um, you, you, you can always find a new shipwreck. So it's a matter of time, but it's kind of something that you get to hear through fishermen, you got to explore and then find out, but uh, there, there are lots. There are lots. So I think the global estimate is there's about 2 million shipwrecks in our littering our oceans. I think it was some number like that. Um, so, you know, if there are ships, like you say, if there are ships, there'll be shipwrecks. There are definitely ships in our oceans. 90% of everything is shipped. So there are obviously going to be lots. Um, I, I'm just sort of curious about um, maybe, can you tell us which your favorite is? I mean, I know the answer. Oh, how did you find the Worcestershire? Okay, what's your favorite wreck? Okay, good question. And I will tell you uh, one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons I think there are shipwrecks have been world wars. Hmm. World War One and World War Two, And Sri Lanka in that way is quite significant. Because on the west coast of Sri Lanka, in Colombo, we have two World War I wrecks. And in the east coast, we have about five or six World War II wrecks. Right? So it's quite incredible that the west coast World War I, east coast World mm-hmm. War II. And uh, so I would say one of my favorite wrecks, uh, I think all wrecks are favorite. Uh, but uh, I would think what's special in my heart would be the Worcestershire and the Persians. Because that's two projects that I did a lot of uh, effort, lots of research, a lot of diving to figure out what these wrecks were, and uh, found the bell and identified ID projects. Okay, so that's great. That feeds into the two questions that have come in. One is uh, from Lucky or Naren, I'm not sure who, but uh, how did you find the Worcestershire? And then Jan asks, have you found any treasure? So I guess there's that what you just said sort of links those two but can you tell us a little bit about how you found the Worcestershire and then maybe talk us talk about the bell and any other treasure that you might have found 
All right, so great questions. Um, so, you know, initially in my diving, uh, I would say adventure, I wasn't really interested in the history of wrecks. I just wanted to dive the wreck and be in a very deep place uh, with the fish. And uh, so I was looking for wrecks just to dive. I wasn't really interested about finding the history. It never occurred to me. So when I heard from in Dehivala, the fishermen were talking about this very deep wreck called Baba Visi Hai and uh, shipwreck at 26 fathoms. I was like intrigued. Okay, where is this ship? I just wanted to dive it, right? So I somehow took me about two years to make the contacts, find the fishermen, and they find this uh, location. And did a sonar scan and found the exact point. But fishermen knew where the wreck was because they were fishing there every night. Mm -hmm. And I did a solo dive to 50, 57 meters. And there was this massive shipwreck, right? So I was thrilled. I was on my own, there was so much fish, and uh, it was like heaven for me, right? But after I was diving this one about four or five times, it's, suddenly there was a question like, what's, what, this, what is this wreck? So then, it was then when I started doing research and trying to figure out uh, what this wreck was. So I did measurements, I was looking for evidence, I was going through historical archives, trying to narrow down shipwrecks that sank in the area. And then I found that uh, during World War I, and this is a really interesting story, and I think this is everyone should, uh, you know, in history, do, are we taught about World War I impact uh, in Sri Lanka? I, I, I don't think I was, I don't know anything about World War I. Not in I mean, Yeah, exactly. So I was quite amazed to find that there was this uh, German commerce trader called the SMS Wolf, and it was a top secret mission during World War I. They disguised this warship to look like a normal commercial shipping liner. And it was sneaking around the world for 15 months without calling the port, right? And it survived purely by capturing or sinking around 35, if I remember correct, 30 to 35 ships by stealing the coal and taking prisoners, all the food, all the, you know, materials like copper, everything. And it survived for 15 months. It came all the way from Germany, went to South Africa, Sri Lanka, New Zealand, Australia, and went all the way back successfully. Epic journey, uh, SMS Wolf. And when it passed Sri Lanka in 1917 during World War One, it laid sea mines of Mount Lavinia and also of uh, Modar. Okay. Right? And uh, these sea mines were the reason that the Worcestershire and the Perseus sank because uh, the Worcestershire, Worcestershire struck the sea mines on 17th of February 1917, and a few days later, the Perseus struck the sea mines. Uh, so during this time, it's very interesting because the British really didn't want to say publicly that there was a German raider going around. So they were very secretive about it and they were giving various excuses saying there were internal explosions, all that. But later they had to admit that there was this rogue uh, raider going all around the world and sinking ships. So these two were the World War One ships, only World War One ships in Sri Lanka that has been sunk by the wolf and actually by anyone. So these are two World War One wrecks in Sri Lanka. That's cool. And what about treasures? Like, you know, you know, there's the bell, I would think of that. Also, uh, also the famed uh, um, chamber pot that we have talked about yes, many times. Yes. It depends on what you consider treasure. But, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and also just talk about the, what you did with the bell, for example? Because I think that's a really important part of the story as well. Yeah, so I think a very, very important question. Um, so one of the reasons I take uh, material from shipwrecks is for purpose of identification and uh, documentation. So uh, to be honest, it's a wrong thing to do, to take things out of a shipwreck. However, I also closely work with the Maritime Archaeological Unit and actually uh, other government agencies. And uh, whatever I find, I hand it over to mm. the government. So again, there are two reasons for this. Ideally, I would like to actually leave some of the things that I find on the shipwreck. Uh, however, there are concerns that as diving gets more popular, shipwrecks are visited and uh, stuff is taken out from, from shipwrecks. So one of the reasons I actually collaborate with the Maritime Archaeology Unit is to, uh, to actually take some of these uh, artifacts that are there. They are not necessarily valuable. Like, it's not like gold or silver or jewelry or anything. Uh, they may be like ceramic pots, they may be the ship's bell. However, they are valuable from a historical standpoint because that's, mm -hmm. those are the only pieces of evidence that can point to the origin of the ship. 
Mm-hmm. So, for example, a plate might have the name of the ship's company or the ship's name. The bell will definitely have the ship's uh, name in it, right? So, uh, that's the only reason I actually look for it. And uh, everything I find, I have documented and handed over to the maritime archaeological unit. Uh, archaeological unit. And also, it's, uh, the, the, those findings are documented in my book, uh, Ghost of the Deep, Diving the Ships of Shipwrecks of Sri Lanka. So it's, it's, I think the greatest pressure for me, from a historical standpoint, is the knowledge that we will not lose. It's, it's, we know now, there's the Worcestershire, there's the Perseus, and those other wrecks, and you know the history where it came from, what happened. And I think the greatest pressure I find is uh, artificial coral reefs, you know, beautiful places, beneath the sea and I, and I think, I mean, you know, can you breathe gold? Can you eat silver? You can't, right? But imagine being in a really beautiful place and, and, and in this day and age, these are the treasures that we are not having, right? We are living in cities, we are living in concrete jungles, you know, we go, we have to go travel hundreds of kilometers to visit maybe Yala or Vilpattu or go on vacation in a, in a beautiful place, but why? Right, so, so for me, the greatest pressure is a, it's a natural place and, and shipwrecks are really great artificial coral reefs, with beautiful corals, beautiful fish. And for me, that's the greatest, again, greatest pressure. Yeah, that's true. And I obviously, I totally, utterly agree with you on that. And also, I think the nice thing about diving, um, even though we don't buddy together necessarily, I think there's a strong bond that's created in a community of divers because there is a lot of trust that goes into diving and diving with people, whether you're diving together or, you know, together or however, I think, um, I think it, it can drive same emotion, same time. Yeah. Same emotion, same time, but it can <laughs> definitely, I think it's such a, it's an amazing sport for creating really deep friendships. And I think we can appreciate that. Um, so referring back to your uh, points about, know how amazing these spaces are there was a question from navika who's our eight-year-old huge ocean surf fan who asked what are the sea creatures you most commonly see when you go diving in these places are there any standout species that you can mention um good and a complex question it depends on the region it depends on the ocean it depends on the time and the day and i think one of my I would say the favorite types of fish life is actually schools of fish. I, for some reason, I really love big schools of fish because they, they are almost like one big animal, right? They move, they move in one, you know, the shoal turning around. It, it brings so much energy to the reef. It's, it's quite incredible. I love groupers, you know, the big uh, fish. Yeah, they look big quite, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big, big fish, big groupers. Uh, I like sharks. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, you really can't see uh, many sharks. Whale sharks, you may be able to see, and the whale shark is the largest fish in the in the world. But uh, in um, I would say uh, in, in some countries, like for example the Maldives, it's really easy to see sharks because of the reef topography. Sri Lanka has a lot of sharks, but you don't see them during daytime because they are simply not in the areas we dive, and and sometimes they shy away and they swim away when they near divers. Uh, but uh, I'm, I like any types of fish, the small to the large. So if it's a whale shark, I'm really happy, but maybe it's a small, nice, colorful nudibranch, you know, like a small uh, sea slug. And that can be really interesting to just observe and uh, watch. Yeah, so I, I think Narin and I are bigger fans of nudibranchs. And for all, all of you who are wondering what a nudibranch is, we did do an ocean creature feature on Ocean Swell about nudibranchs, some really fun facts. Uh, about some nudibranchs that even feast on Portuguese man of wars. So think about it something 60 times their size. You can check it out on our website, uh, the Ocean Creature Feature Series. There's 10 parts to that. Um, so there was a question from Sashiko, which I think is a really great segue into um, sort of your life in general, is uh, who funds your expeditions? And perhaps this is a great time to reveal to everyone that why you have all this passion around diving, why you clearly sound like all you do is live, breathe and you know, sleep diving, you actually have a day job, right? So like, do you want to talk a little bit about that and like how these expeditions, you fund them or are, who funds them? Yeah, good good question. So uh, the funding is actually partly self-funded and I also I make some money by writing articles, selling photographs, selling uh, videos and maybe uh, some... Self-funding. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's uh, that. 
plus it's it's also uh, especially when it comes to expeditions it's uh, actually spending my own money which i earn in my day job which i which which i will get to later but um, yeah so the uh, self fund funding is the, the the i would say the biggest uh, area sourcing for the expeditions and you want me to talk about what i do and is that no but i, I it, it's more just i want people um i want people to understand that you know you know a lot of people think that if they're not doing the thing that they love then they will not be able to ever do it but i want people to understand that you can still do that stuff uh even if you have a regular job that maybe is necessary for uh earning your income and keep and keeping yourself sustainable there's still other ways to go about your passions and i think that's really important to remember that's something that you do you know which i don't fully understand because i live breathe and eat the thing i am passionate about right so we live sort of different lives although they uh, overlap right um uh, there's another question here how do you think the diving industry will reemerge from the lockdown you have any thoughts about that um i think it it will be related to many other things that will be affected by the lockdown and it will emerge with the equal speed of everything else that recovers again it's a uh, it depends on which country it is which region uh, for example now i have a friend in indonesia she has a diving center she is saying that they are planning to open up uh, in that uh, area do some limited dives so i think diving is also something that uh maybe it doesn't really invite too much social distancing in its very nature of how it's done like you know, if you're in a boat you don't i mean we divers don't get comfortable big boats right you know how it is we are cramped equipment is all, all everywhere and uh, sea can be rough we'll be holding to each other on to each other so social distancing is not very strong for for diving and uh, so so that's why i think it will uh, it will need it will also have the same impact uh, which has in other industries and other areas where we need to maybe start in a very limited and a small scale and gradually build up but it will go along with the same pace of the whole society recovering from uh, corona yeah that's true and um i think it is important you know and the next question is really important which is uh, and it comes from narain what are the most important aspects of being a responsible dive tourist i think this is a really important question to address um okay uh this uh, the the what are the most important aspects of being a responsible dive responsible dive, dive tourist right so i think one of the very basic uh, rules is um uh, not to impact the marine environment which you are diving so if you are a diver diver tourist it's actually having sufficient skills uh, skills so that you don't disturb the marine environment and for example that means that you need to maintain your buoyancy you are not crashing into the reef your fins are not touching the corals you are not touching anything and uh, basically you take nothing from the ocean you only leave bubbles so that's i think one of the primary uh, thing that every diver can do Uh, apart from that i think it's uh, we need to look at the whole industry about the carbon footprint uh, it's leaving in terms of you know the diving boats the engines then uh, air travel so there's a whole lot of things around it but i think it, uh, without complicating the simplest thing anyone can do is to be a good diver and yeah. uh, take nothing leave nothing yeah and also I- I mean one of the other things is also to pick responsible operators like operators that are reputable um and are known to be very caring about this resource that they are you know making their income on right so being very careful about the how they maybe anchor their boats or um how they're interacting with the species or how they allow the you know how they allow the tourists that go with them to interact in these spaces and I think that would also be something um important right absolutely i think you covered a uh, lot more good points and uh, i think uh, the dive operators need to have responsible dive guides for example who make sure that their customers don't really affect the environment in any way and you know we hear instances where some people they want to take photos and maybe the dive guide will take a nudie prank and it move it to a more 
nice background, right? So I think those are things that kind of cross the line uh, because I think if you are capturing something, you should capture it as it is. Going back home and photoshopping is it's fine, right? That doesn't harm doesn't harm the environment. But you should move animals or you shouldn't uh, try to get them to pose for you. In, it's not it's not the, it's not a real picture. Then you are taking something real. Yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, Photoshop. But be honest about the fact that you photoshopped it, right? Because I mean, you know, if you've got this amazing photograph and it's really just photoshopped, then that's also problematic. So it's a yeah. whole ethical conversation there. Okay, well, we're coming to the wrap up sign, but I do I would like people to sort of like, um, you know, like. You know what? Are, what what drives you? I just want people to have a few takeaway things. Um, and uh, what is it that drives you to uh, do this? Well, I mean, you know, I know it's there's an excitement around discovery and stuff like that. But in terms of the marine environment, in terms of uh, what we see down there, like what is it that excites you? And what would you like people to think about when they go diving? Um, I think uh, what really drives me is the, the return that I get in terms of the uh, thrill, the sense of adventure. And I think as a kid, I always wanted to be an astronaut. And I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't bright enough to uh, go to NASA. So I had to say the next best thing. Yes, I, had to. I couldn't go up, so I go down, right? So it's very easy, simple math. So, um, and you know, it, it's, it's almost like being in space. It's almost like visiting uh, a different alien world. And you know, when you go to a shipwreck and you're alone and there's this amazing place, it's almost like you're the first, you're like Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. And especially if it's an undiscovered shipwreck, right? So it's, it's that feeling, that moment, it's such a big uh, rush and a reward that uh, I, I keep seeking it, finding new things. That's really cool. And uh, actually, this is a really great question, uh, again, from Narin, uh, disguised as Lakwi. Uh, at what stage in your diving should you pick up a camera? And I think that's a really valuable question. Uh, you know, should you pick it up when you start diving or what stage on your journey should you consider even starting to take those pictures and focusing on extra things? Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question, really. I don't think there's an answer. I can talk about my experience. Um, I, I think started in, uh, getting into diving photography on or around the 10th dive. Uh, but I think what's important is when you start diving, it should be about pictures. It should be about at least the first 10 dives, perfecting your skills, making sure you have your buoyancy correct. right? So if you have those to a certain extent, and you're not harming the marine environment, then having a small camera to start with, I don't think is uh, any harm. And actually, I would say that uh, getting into underwater photography helped my diving skills. Because to take a good picture, you got to quickly get everything else sorted out. You can't take a good picture if you're bobbing up and down. You can't take a good picture if you're drifting in the current. You can't take a good picture if uh, you know you are entangled in your own equipment, or you're running out of air, or you're worried mm -hmm. about, right? So. You need to make sure that you can live underwater first, safe, safely for that few moments, and then take a picture. So, in a way that the need to take a picture almost made me a good diver, so that I could handle a camera underwater made me a good diver. So it was kind of fed into each other. Uh, it's my own experience. Right. I don't really have the correct answer. To that. No, I mean I don't think there's a correct answer, but I think you touched on some very valid points, which is. The point is you need to be a good diver. So it's not just about getting a, becoming a better diver for yourself, but it is also about um, becoming a better diver so that you're not destroying the environment that you're there to enjoy, right? So uh, if, you're, if you're not good at your buoyancy and managing yourself in the water column, uh, you might kick, you might land on things, you might crush things. You might try to grab onto stuff because you're panicking because you've got a camera and then you've got this one hand that you're you know, drifting. And so I think that's what we want to be mindful of. Um, and you want to make sure that people aren't uh, doing that. So the advice, I mean, I would also say as a, a, in my experience in the marine environment in general, I think you can almost take better pictures also if you spend a little time watching. Uh, because if you can understand the behavior of a species, like and if I talk about dolphins and stuff, I notice people immediately take their cameras out and start clicking. And I always say, just 
watch you know like watch the movement watch so you can start to predict what the animal is going to do so that when you get your camera out yeah. you can be best position to take that photograph uh, which also makes you much more mindful of what you're doing and i think that's what we're talking about um you know being mindful and and that that's really quite important um i do want to wrap up but i think we get a couple of more questions um i've heard il- fictional stories about it but is there illegal treasure hunting activity from wrecks happening in the world yes absolutely that's one of the biggest problems facing the whole world and lots of governments uh, shipwrecks are stripped for two reasons one is uh, for artifacts valuable historically valuable artifacts and also for the metal unfortunately which uh, now south asian uh, shipwrecks around singapore are actually in grave danger because uh, uh, apparently because in 1942 during world war 2 there were some nuclear bombs that were ex- exploded in that whole area uh, anything any metal that was that sank into the ocean before that contains less level of radiation so they are supposed to be more valuable for that reason these wrecks are being completely destroyed blown up and salvaged in, in south asia so lots of uh, government agencies world agencies are worried about this problem and they are taking certain measures to address it but it's an ongoing problem and there's no solution yet okay and okay i got a, a few more questions um and i'll try to go quickly through them but one is um you know when you've been diving over certain wrecks at certain wrecks over and over for a long period of time uh what are the kinds of um, human impacts that you see on these dive sites it again depends on the distance of the wreck to show and how deep these wrecks are uh the shallow wrecks are completely i would say destroyed for various reasons and not necessarily human impact uh, but however having said that most of the shallow wrecks are completely salvaged the metal artifacts i mean it's like pick to the bone there's nothing mm-hmm. there you can there's no way to id the wreck uh, if there's no historical um, record of any shipwrecks going down in that area it's just a skeletal hull metal hull that's underwater right so uh, that's one uh, reason the other one is you know we are finding more and more plastic uh, in the ocean mm. and in some of the deep shipwrecks uh, unfortunately that you see and it's quite shocking because you are in this very beautiful environment and suddenly you find a very familiar plastic product that you are you actually have you know back home and then you also realize that you are responsible for this because you know it's it's you who buy this use it and then you throw it away in your garbage and then it's in a ends up in a landfill and then comes down the river the ocean and then it goes to the ocean and so it's yeah. it's actually us who, who are responsible for it and yeah. the- okay so i've got a couple more questions i'm watching the time only because when it hits 60 minutes instagram chucks you off so right. we have 10, we have nine more minutes okay so this is a race against the clock um okay. but there's a question from vidra there's so many dive centers across around the coastline uh, to get you started on diving what should someone new to diving consider in, in picking a place to do their course i think that's a great question um so it's it's very tempting to go for the lowest cost a lot of people uh, you know think that okay let me look around let me bargain and go to the dive center that's offering the lowest cost uh i think then you need to remember that this is about your life and there's no price for your life right so don't go by the cost uh i think it's like with anything and now today we have the internet you can look at reviews you can look at what people say us divers there are so many divers now we have the sri lanka subway club uh, you know as a diving group in sri lanka so you can ask people who know about it and then get references and and go to go to place that people say okay it's a good school maybe it's bit expensive uh, but you know it's worth it yeah i totally agree okay so i'm going to take just two more questions because we're going to get chucked out uh, okay. this one is very important from travis um i it would be great if you could address it what do you feel about dive operators that promote spear fishing well uh, very simply it's against the law so i mean i can't support it because it's against the law it's against the law of sri lanka dynamite fishing spear fishing it's against the law 
so it's not a good thing and i think if any dive operator does that and it is quite ironic that a dive operator would want to do that because you know you 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 kind of make your money by showing people what's beautiful underwater the beautiful fish and the next thing you are taking someone else to shoot the same fish you are showing another customer and making money out of right so it doesn't really concede uh, coexisting so uh, for me it's it's a big problem But I got yeah. to just do that's that's all. Okay, I don't. I I um I think we might get kicked out in about two minutes. If we do, I'll log back in to say the final goodbye because I do want to make sure there's a goodbye. But I have one question, and I do want uh you know I don't think people realize that we have a really incredible wreck in Sri Lanka, um the wreck at Gurawaya. And can you tell people a little bit about it because it is a really important one historically as well. Yes, it's uh. the oldest shipwreck or it's one of the oldest shipwrecks in south, uh, south asia it's uh, 200 bc so it's about 2200 years old carbon dated and uh, it makes i think it kind of puts a uh, icing on the i mean sri lanka is i think the the strong point for sri lanka when it comes to diving is the shipwrecks we have so many shipwrecks that more south asian countries don't have singapore may have some shipwrecks but you know like thailand malaysia we we actually can beat those countries and then on top of this we have the oldest shipwreck uh, in in south asia so it's a it's a active archaeological dig site so you can't really dive it unless it's with, uh, without permission and and still a lot of things are being found out but it's it's a time capsule so it's it's an amazing place i have dived it and i think you have as well actually yeah. we dived it together right so you know you know it's such an amazing place with so many artifacts and it's it's like almost going back in time 2200 years ago Yeah, and it's a wooden ship, right? Which is also yeah. kind of a thing. Um, and the fact that I mean, wood uh, obviously it would normally deteriorate in air, but there's still some structure left because of the conditions of underwater, right? So, um, well done. Did uh, we so get long. kicked out? Yeah, we got kicked out, but um, because it was exactly sixty minutes, because we got into the room a little bit early. Um, since we have a little bit of time, I want to say goodbye, but I do. Let me just go back and talk about Gorava like briefly. Can you just like Talk, talk, maybe talk a little bit about sort of what kind of artifacts are found and what kind of a wreck uh, we're th- talking about. It. You know, it's so old and it's different. We talked about the fact that it's wooden, which is obviously different. Uh, but can you give us a little more insight into the wreck and just kind of excite people? Because I want people to realize Sri Lanka is a pretty special place in so many ways, and so many ways we don't realize sometimes. Yeah, so I think the first thing I would like to tell uh, tell all of you is that we have a great agency that works, uh, you know, a professional archaeologist, and and I'm not a professional archaeologist, right? Uh, my strength is diving, technical diving, the technical side of it. But we have this team, the Maritime Archaeological Unit of uh, Sri Lanka, set up under the Central Cultural Fund, and these are proper scientists, qualified scientists trained abroad, and they are really doing a fantastic job. They are based in Gaul. Uh, they are the ones who are actually very patiently and and it's such hard work they have to actually dive a whole season to 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 explore this shipwreck and it, it's a small shipwreck it's, it's it's a small area right but it's 30 meters deep and sometimes the current are so strong sometimes they use like small brushes to you know unravel the sand and find inside so what they have found so far they have found um, like stone benches uh, pot shards big pot shards and and uh, copper ingots some of the things so all of these actually um, help them to place what era this shipwreck could be so there's this whole uh, narrative about that these ships could be you know belonging belonging to certain certain time periods however it's not really clear whether the ship, this shipwreck actually came to the godavari port mm. because the godavari port was an ancient port and there was actually a government tax office with the government the king's tax office right so uh, not really sure whether it was something to do with that but or whether it's a ship that was passing by and sank but uh, again yeah so i think we need to really recognize these guys uh, doing a lot of hard work going all around sri lanka documenting and uh, and preserving shipwrecks yeah and i think you know we are more familiar with if you think about the fossil hunters right like you see images of them with their little brushes brushing off the 
uh, of the dinosaur bones and stuff, right? And it's exactly what they're doing underwater, which to me is just mind blowing. I mean, I remember when we went there, and there were these little parts that were uncovered, and they were talking to us about how they would sit down there, like at you know at the bottom of the ocean, just sitting and dusting off gently. But of course, like one sweep of a current, and it's all covered up again, right? So it's a much more complicated process, and. Really big、uh, kudos to the Maritime Archaeological Unit of Sri Lanka. They've done amazing work, and、uh, obviously they've got a you know a lot of supporters because they do great work. People are more willing to support them and sort of in their endeavors, which I think is really important.、Uh, okay, so I always have a questions.、Um, so everybody, the video will be recorded. It will go up onto our website,、um, so you can check it out there. It'll be on our YouTube, all oceans for org.、Uh, website is oceans for dot org.、Um, You know, come back every Wednesday. We release a tiny desk adventure by a tiny by a tiny desk adventurer who will talk about something they're passionate about. It's a less than five minute video, and then we'll have a host a live Q and A. So you can actually get to know these people, interact with them, ask your questions,、um, and I think it's just a way for us to introduce to you this incredible world of the oceans and what more there is out there. And just to wrap up with DJ, I just want to point out that he does have a book called "Ghosts of the Deep." It's available at Vich Theafa and a lot of reputable bookstores. It is beautiful, all the photography stuff that he's taken over time.、Um, it's got all his research, and you will really—I mean, if you don't appreciate it, I think you'll even more appreciate how much hard work he's gone through to try to spotlight Sri Lanka as. Uh, an incredible destination for diving in a very different way than we think about. We think about the Maldives and the reefs and the beautiful fish and stuff. We have a lot of that, but it's just artificial reefs in terms of the shipwrecks that we have to learn to go to enjoy, but also protect because it is part of our cultural heritage, and looking after it is really important.、Um, and so, do check out that book. Go buy it. You know, support DJ's expeditions because, as you can tell, man just supports himself, and I think he could use your funds. So this is one way to channel your funds, but also own something in return. So with that's awesome, and with that, follow him at Tech Dive in Sri Lanka if you don't already. Keep following us at Oceans with Org and join us on this incredible adventure that we're on.、Uh, thank you very much, DJ, once again, and、uh, thank you, Asha.、Yeah, stay safe. Bye. Bye.